Good afternoon. My name is Alex Reich, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine, and to the second event of our new monthly webinar series, Climate Conversations, Pathways to Action. The National Academies provide independent, objective advice to inform policy with evidence, spark progress and innovation, and confront challenging issues for the benefit of society. In keeping with this mission, we're excited to host these conversations about issues relevant to national policy action on climate change. Today, we won't be taking questions from the audience. However, we would like to hear your feedback and your ideas for future conversations, which I invite you to share after the event in the survey linked just above this video. There, you'll also find a link to register for our April 15th webinar on the cost of climate change and environmental justice in the United States. Our conversation this afternoon will be recorded and made available on this webpage tomorrow. But today, one year after the World Health Organization declared COVID-19 a global pandemic and life changed around the world and at home, we will be reflecting on the pandemic and discussing the intersections between it and another global challenge, climate change. We'll also consider how the pandemic and climate change intersect with other longstanding issues in the US, racism and equity. This has been a hard year and I'm grateful you're here with us today to reflect on it and to talk about how we can continue to learn from it to inform policies that enable us to be more resilient to our ongoing and future challenges. We're honored to be joined by Laura Helmuth, the Editor-in-Chief of Scientific American, who will introduce our conversationalists and moderate the event. Thank you again for joining the National Academies for Climate Conversations. Laura, it's all yours. Thank you very much. Uh, welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, and thank you to the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine for holding this event uh, and, and helping us talk about some of the biggest challenges of our time. Uh, you know, climate change and COVID are global catastrophes, uh, but they play out at a local level, uh, both quite shockingly fast. And we're here after just one year to talk about the connections between these two catastrophes. What can we learn uh, from each one and how do they relate to one another? We've got a lot of ground to cover. So um, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll introduce our, our panelists, our, our discussants. Um, so today we're here with uh, Georges Benjamin and Chris Ebay. And uh, they are, uh, Georges is the executive director of the American Public Health Association, which is the nation's oldest and largest organization of public health professionals. He's been there since December 2002. Um, he's a health leader, a practitioner, an administrator, and the former secretary of health for the state of Maryland. And he's a member of the National, Academy's, uh, National Academy of Medicine. And he's been, he's been very busy this year, as you can imagine, uh, advising policymakers, journalists, and the public about the pandemic and how to make uh, communities safer, as safe as possible in this disastrous year. Uh, and Chris Ebay is a professor in the Department of Global Health and Department of Environmental and Occupational Health <laughs> Science at the University of Washington. She studies the impacts and adaptation to climate change, uh, including extreme events, thermal stress, foodborne safety and security, waterborne diseases, vectorborne diseases. Uh, there are a lot of ways that that climate intersects with health and, and she's one of our leading experts in those. And she's also vice chair of the National Academy's committee to advise the US Global Change Research Program. Um, and just uh, two days ago, they released an important report called uh, the US Global Change uh, Research Needs and Opportunities uh, for the next decade, uh, which will advise the group that's making our climate change, our long-term climate change plan for the next decade. And you can see that report in the link um, above the video. So, it, and it's it's a really important report. It's a very interesting report. And we'll talk about it some more um, it, over the course of this hour. So thank you for joining us, uh, Georges and Chris, and welcome to the conversation. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank you. And yeah, I'd like to, to start with Georges, if you could uh, sort of lay the groundwork on the COVID side of things and talk about, you know, some of the, the biggest changes that have happened in the past year and particularly the things I think that were, that were the biggest surprises and how the pandemic has played out. Any important lessons, especially that might be relevant for how we think about climate? Well, let me, let me just say that, you know, we um, in public health, we've been talking about the great pandemic 
um, for all of my time in healthcare. Um, you know, I got out of medical school about 1978, and I've been hearing about the pandemic that's going to come every year. And the big one, um, even though we've had some smaller ones, haven't hit. So this was the big one. Um, it's the greatest that we've had in uh, over 100 years. And as you know, it has totally disrupted our way of living. Um, it, um, we have over 29 million cases in the United States alone. And you know, you know, hundreds of millions around the world, and over a half million deaths in the U.S. In fact, the number of people who have died in the U.S. in the last year is more than the, all of the six years of World War II. Um, and so, I, you know, it has enormous impact. And we've had a reduction in life expectancy um, provisionally in our country by a year. And of course, people who who know um, public health and issues around life expectancy, it is a big deal to lose a year of life expectancy. So it's, it's, it has really been a phenomenal um, disruptive event for the whole planet. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, and Chris, you know, we with, with climate change, we talk a lot about you know, sea level rise and some of the kind of planetary scale changes that are happening, but it's also a health and a, and a public health catastrophe. Could you tell us a little bit about uh, what some of the biggest health impacts are currently from climate change and, and where the, you know, the biggest risks are in the immediate future? Thank you. And it's a fairly long answer. I'll try to summarize it quite briefly. Any health issue that can be affected by the weather can be affected by climate change. Heat-related morbidity and mortality is increasing in the US with more heat waves. We've seen devastating floods and we saw consequences of those floods for our health. But it's also issues of vector-borne diseases, for example, diseases like dengue is likely changing its range in the United States. We worry about issues related to air quality, both thinking about ozone and how ozone has a short-term impact on our health. But there's also a very recent publication on how the pollen season has lengthened with climate change. So those of you with allergies and asthma, we've got a much longer pollen season. In many places, it's more intense. Internationally, we worry significantly about food security. Food and water security will be major challenges throughout the century. And there's other issues as well that very directly connect with what Georges was talking about. For example, we know that weather can affect people's mental health and we've seen the strong mental health impacts from COVID. And there's a lot that we can learn from the research that we've done on COVID and have done on climate change to make sure that we have the systems in place to protect mental health. Yeah, thank you. And let's let's start with the mental health. I mean, it's you know, it's an infectious disease, but it's also you know, COVID is an infectious disease, but it's also, you know, we're the the biggest public health or the biggest mental health stressor uh, in in our lifetimes. Um, are there you know, as you see the intersection between climate and COVID, um, you know, are there any any lessons uh, for how to how to recognize, anticipate, and mitigate the, the mental health burden that we're seeing. Georges, do you want me to start? Sure, go ahead. Well, I'll start mm -hmm. with, there are lots of mental health consequences of changing in weather patterns. And one thing that COVID has really highlighted is there's so many underserved areas of our country. And we don't actually know how many people suffer from a variety of mental health illnesses. And being able to better understand what the current burden is and to think about how that could shift with changing weather patterns and making sure after a big disaster, whether it be COVID or a hurricane or a flood, that there are sufficient services available for people who need them. That all of these are quite disruptive to our lives. And as we know very clearly now in mental health, all of us are being affected with with the changes we've seen with COVID. Uh, Georges? Yeah, thanks, Chris. You know, and to build on what Chris said, you know, the, the real challenge you have is that we certainly have some overt manifestations of, of mental health. But the real challenge we have 
is the fact that it, it, is, is a, it is a very much a silent disease because people just don't recognize it. Um, they often don't want to admit it. Um, and it, it has a very, very long tail. So whether it's from climate change or whether it's from this kind of pandemic where we've been trying to uproot our society and it's really changed the way we deal with one another. And, you know, we're all doing everything on um, social media or Zoom um, or pick another platform. Um, the, 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 the humanization of the way we engage with one another gets terribly, terribly disrupted in both of these activities. And then the fact that we don't have adequate resources um, makes it a big deal. And we often talk about resiliency. Well, the, the impact of mental health um, that we're seeing from both climate change and COVID lays um, bare our inability, at least so far, to build a society that is as resilient as it needs to be. Now, communities can be resilient. People are very resilient. Kids are very resilient overall, but we can do better. And I think mental health is an example of where we need to build supports, resources, and, and build really a firewall so that people don't move up the uh, escalation of mental health problems. Um, we are seeing, for example, suicides that are up um, during this, this COVID um, for a variety of reasons. And we're gonna continue to, to see that um, as part of at least the COVID outbreak. Um, and it's just, it's, it's something again, we, we, know, we know it happens and, and there are lots of preventive things we can do to, to address it. And if I could, I'd like to really underscore, Georgia's your comment about the long term. Yeah. There's excellent research done in the UK on flooding and comparing people who are not flooded, people who are disrupted, and people whose houses were actually flooded, showing a significant increase in a range of mental health issues. And after years of follow up, the people who are flooded still have mental health issues at a higher rate than the general population. So all of the structures that Georges is talking about need to be long-term, mm -hmm. not just put in place for the few weeks after the flood, after a particular event, but making sure that they're there for the long haul. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as you said, as you say, these, the problem, you know, any disaster can be amplified and, you know, in, including you know, mental health issues. And I, that seems like something we, we saw after Katrina too, um, you know, a lack of resources, including mental health resources, certainly a lack of financial resources and, and recovery, um, you know, led to you know, still existing, uh, you know, long-term consequences that seem like, you know, that you can't stop a hurricane, but you can stop some of these, you know, just devastating long-term consequences, or at least mitigate them. And, and I think that's, that's um, certainly mitigation is, is you know, one of the key terms of the, of the report that just came out two days ago that, that Chris was the, one of the directors on. Um, and that really, uh, so the, I, I think the emphasis on this report, how did it differ from some of the earlier uh, advice that, that this group has given to the um, Global Climate Change Research Group? Thanks for the question. And the committee is designed to advise US Global Change Research Program. And they produce decadal research strategies or next research strategies in 2022. And the committee took it upon itself to think about what kinds of approaches, what kinds of issues do we think would be beneficial to include in that strategic plan. And we took the perspective of being about at 2030 or about at the end of the next decadal research strategy and looking backwards and thinking about what are the big security risks that we face as Americans. And one of those of course is health and, and have some suggestions about how to approach these challenges, focusing very much on the fact that as you look at health and food security, water security, energy security, our infrastructure, national security, these all intersect in lots of different ways. Much of our research to date has been within sectors and we've done relatively little as a nation looking across those intersections and thinking about how the intersection of water, agriculture and health 
will not only interact within itself, but interact with the physical climate change, interact with ecosystems, and making sure that the research is designed with user needs in mind. So we focus on what are the needs of users so that we can have effective decisions taken to increase resilience over the next decade. Nice. Yeah, thank you for uh, thank you for the report. And again, if you haven't seen it yet, it's uh, it just came out Tuesday. It's in, in, an important distillation of, of knowledge uh, for for the public and certainly for policymakers. Um, so you know, one of the the big things that has become more apparent through COVID, I think, is the unequal burden of disease and the unequal susceptibility to to risk from a pandemic, from climate, and uh, you know, we, it, at Scientific America, we, we published several stories with the headline that it's it's not race that that uh, is a risk factor for dying of COVID, but racism. And I assume that that's that's the case for susceptibility to health consequences of of climate change as well. Is that you know, systemic racism makes everything worse, and certainly makes health threats worse. And I think George's um, at the um, uh, at your organization, APHA, you have a, a race and health, um, well, I'm sure a lot of initiatives, but a, a big project. And uh, could you tell us a little bit about that? Sure, well, we, we certainly have, have published a very nice academic uh, book on um, racism and health. And so that's my commercial announcement for the day. Um, but we also um, have been cataloging all of the communities around the country that are have been um, declaring racism as a public health problem. Um, and we're trying now to figure out not just how they're cataloged, but now what do we do to try to help those communities, to empower those communities, to make those declarations real. Um, and we've got a project where we're looking at uh, putting together um, a policy database to figure out, again, what policies work, what are the evidence that if you do X, then you get Y, which impacts racism. Um, and if you just think about many of the structural racism issues that we have, whether it's redlining or not adding people um, access to capital, um, you know, policies around zoning um, beyond the, the redlining issue, um, access to um, access to good transportation. You know, our nation is about to hopefully once again invest in our failing infrastructure. And we're hoping that that is done in a way that not only improves the, um, the core infrastructure in a way that um, you know, makes our health and well-being better so that we, we build things for health and not just to build them because they look good. We want them to look good. We want them to build them in a healthy way. And we want them to do it in a more green way. But in doing that, we also want to make sure that it's done in a just and equitable way so that... Uh, you know, we um, when we build um, urban communities, for example, we try to de we deal with the heat island effect. We know that urban communities are eight to ten degrees hotter than our rural communities. Well, you can you can adjust that by putting light colored roofs on houses. Well, that's a, that's a homeowners association or a zoning issue by building um, porous pavement to handle water runoff, as an example. Um, by the way, run, water runoff also helps you deal with your, your standing water problem, which um, deals with dengue, malaria, and vector-borne diseases as well. More green space, again, more shade, more reflective surfaces, all those kinds of things that, that result ultimately in cooler communities. So we, we think we can, we can combine good structural investments in infrastructure with reducing health outcomes and do that in a way that addresses some of these health inequities that we have that result from just the way we, we design our communities. Nice, yeah, and it, it seems like one of the, the big um, kind of health injustice issues is how, what's the air like that you breathe? And you know, during this year of an infectious disease pandemic that you know, destroys people's lungs, uh, it seems like air pollution is one of the big areas of overlap um, between you know, mitigating climate change and um, seeing the consequences for, for lung health and for infectious disease pandemic. 
Um, and it, is that, you know, when you're thinking yeah. about the overlaps between these two, that, that may be one of the big ones? One of the big ones, look, look, look the wildfires. Um, we know that those wildfires um, were terrible. And of course, they impacted people miles away. You know, tragically, um, these wildfires um, were, were pretty large. Um, and of course, they don't um, respect geographical or political boundaries. And so people miles away were impacted by toxic fumes. And when you when things burn, they don't just burn grass and trees, they burn houses, they burn plastic. So you get noxic fumes in the air. And then, of course, a lot of these things result in small particulate matter, which injure our lungs. And we know that there's a strong correlation between that and um, higher levels of disease. And even there are some belief that some of those make people more um, impacted if they get exposed to COVID. I don't know, Chris, if you want to build on that, but I think that that's, a, that's another you know, intersection between the environment and COVID. It is a really important intersection. One of the issues that we've talked about in health and climate change community, but the climate change community more broadly, are that when you look at level of preparedness, that people are preparing for one thing at a time. And we saw very clearly during COVID, it's not one thing at a time. I live in Seattle, we had wildfires, we had heat waves and we had COVID all at the same time. And it really highlighted challenges that we're facing in trying to deal with multiple events. And and COVID really laid bare that these compounding events are going to be more frequent. We've been saying this on the climate change side and our level of ability to deal with these at the moment isn't where it has to be. And we have to think of solutions at all scales. A simple one, I live in Seattle, which has a very low penetration of air conditioning. We had very high levels of air pollution from the fires. So when you look at the air quality index over 120 is really considered quite hazardous. My neighborhood was over 250. People don't have air conditioning. It's really hot. What do you tell them to do? Do you close your windows and doors to keep out the air pollution? Do you tell them to open their windows and doors so they can get fresh air in? The city closed our public pools because the air quality was so bad. And the city's now come up with some solutions for what we can do the next time around. It would be nice if we were more proactive. It would be helpful for the health of everyone to think in advance of these kinds of intersections, where they're gonna challenge us and what kinds of structures we can put in place to help prevent avoidable morbidity and mortality. And let me build on that. I mean, if you think about the intersection just we, just we had um, in the South, pr- principally Texas, where we had obviously um, significant um, um, ice storms and weather, um, we had very cold, freezing, knocked out the power systems. Um, And we had people that died because of that. And we did that during the COVID outbreak, which again, also disrupted not just uh, in Texas, but really nationwide, the distribution of vaccines. So um, it slowed up our response. Fortunately, not for many days, but long enough to have a huge human cost and we there, as I understand it, we were minutes away from their whole power grid um, failing, which would have put people out of power for a long time. And of course, we also have the Jackson, Mississippi problem right now. Um, I don't know if they, they're up, their water system's up and running yet or not, but they still are having water problems there, um, which tells you again, the fragility of our infrastructure. And again, another correlation, you can't wash your hands if you don't have clean water. If you don't have clean water, you can't wash your hands, and you're much more likely to get an infectious disease like COVID. So these disasters um, cannot be, as, as Chris pointed out, they cannot be addressed one-on-one. We have to think of these as overlapping disasters, and we need to build a cohesive, all-hazards approach to dealing with these things, both on the adaptation side and on the mitigation side, and then on the emergency response side of what we're doing. And one of the challenges that I see sitting in the climate change arena is that health is not very good at looking into the future. 
And when you tell somebody to do all hazards, think about the all hazards that occurred over the last few weeks. And then people like me come in and say, the future is not going to look like this. The future is going to be a lot hotter. It's going to be more humid. There's going to be more extreme events. We're going to have more opportunities for vector-borne diseases changing their range that you need to think beyond history and start thinking about what the future could hold, which A, is a challenge for human beings in and of itself, but it's also a big challenge when you've got so many constraints on your resources and what you put into preparing for an uncertain future when you need to solve problems today. Mm -hmm. And there is a challenge there with just not sufficient resources to be able to plan for a very different future. Yeah, and let's uh, let's talk about some specifically some specific policy approaches, um, you know, either specific policies or a way of thinking about policies that take into account what we've learned from COVID and our um, and what we know is coming with climate change is here and is coming in the future, and uh, you know. Are there, you know, Chris, you just to follow up on on the report, um, what what are some of the biggest pieces of advice that you both would have for policymakers about how to protect us from the next disasters, how to, you know, prevent the next disasters or make them less disastrous when they come? It's a very good question and something people spend a lot of time trying to work through basically everything's connected to everything else. And so it's having a really big tent. Think back at the very beginning part of COVID, the focus on advice was coming from people in public health, was coming from medicine and from public health professionals. And at some point the economists went, hang on, what you're talking about is gonna have a significant impact on the economy. And so there was good collaborations in many cases between people in public health and people in economics. And when we think about a complex challenge like climate change, what the report keeps emphasizing is we have to talk across the disciplines. That could be facilitated by the federal agencies ensuring that the research is more multidisciplinary. When you think about the way the research is funded in Europe, it is across disciplines. And it needs to be grounded in what what the users need. So there needs to be engagement with the users of this information to make sure that whatever is produced is usable, usable and easily used. And so thinking differently about research, making sure we've got more co-production of that research. And so in the end, we do produce what is going to be helpful for moving our policies forward. Georges? Yeah, I would argue that we need to make sure that science and the evidence informs policy. Um, and I, I'm not just talking about the, the, the medical health sciences, but I'm talking about the environmental sciences. Um, I'm talking about even political science. We need to understand how we, um, how we get people to understand some of the messages. I think one of the more important things is understanding um, how people respond when they give a message. Um, who listens? Who doesn't listen? Who has concerns? Who doesn't have concerns? Um, you know, we spend a lot of time um, uh, selling people a whole range of products. And they're very, very good at getting you buying to buy stuff that you may not quite want it to get on Monday, but it looks so exciting that you get it and on Tuesday. And yet we haven't figured out how to get people to respond effectively um, to protect themselves when they know that last year we had 30 named storms, you know, that we know that um, 12 of them, you know, had landfall, that six of these were major hurricanes. You know, the Gulf got hit numerous times. And yet getting people to build differently, move and live in different places, think about, you know, the the issues involved in that, we haven't done it. Um, And it's, it's amazing that we just don't use what we know about human behavior and the way people think about things to to, um, address problems that we know are going to occur. And then we throw billions, not millions, billions of dollars to fix things that millions of dollars would have prevented. And I think that's one of the lessons that we've got to learn from a policy perspective that 
Benjamin Franklin was right, you know, about um, prevention. <laughs> he absolutely was right. Yeah, and and it seems like climate and and pandemics are the you know the two biggest example, two of the biggest examples of that. I mean, you know, one one of the reasons that the pandemic has played out so differently in different places is, uh, you know, just a, a function of how well funded and resourced um, public health departments were across across the country and ac around the world. And um, I assume, would you both say that, you know, in investing in prevention it pays off many, many fold for, for both of your areas of expertise. Um, so, you know, during the COVID pandemic, people's behavior has changed drastically. Um, has that informed any kind of thinking about, you know, what what the possibilities are for rapid action against climate change and, and preparing for climate health consequences? Do you see connections there? I've got two particular comments on that. One is particularly people who sit in the climate science part of, of the research enterprise have looked at the massive interventions around COVID and the meager interventions on climate change and have listened for years for politicians saying, we can't make those kinds of investments. And there are hundreds at least of editorials saying, uh, you did that, you just did that for COVID. You could do that if you had the political will. The second perspective I think is important to bring forward is that when you look at mitigation policies, you look at ways to, to reduce emissions from coal fire power plants, reduce emissions from tailpipes, have people eat the kind of diet their doctor recommends. All of those are associated with significant reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. They're also really good for our health. And if you, if you find ways to count how many avoided hospitalizations, how many avoided premature deaths, and then you value that, the value of, that, of those changes for our health is of the same order of magnitude, if not larger than the cost of mitigation. And yet when we hear about mitigation, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, it's all about the cost. And I'm only talking about the health benefits or benefits for our ecosystems as well. And so the benefits for us as individuals and for our society are incredibly large. And the discussion needs to shift to the benefits of mitigation for everybody. Georges? Yeah, you know, one of the, one of the things that I um, um, spent my time doing in, when I was in the, the District of Columbia was I actually spent uh, 10 months as a deputy fire chief running the EMS system in, in Washington, D.C. And one of the things you learn about in the fire department is that, um, you know, they, they, there's, there's a standby cost to, to, um, to having a fire department. But if you have a fire, you absolutely want it. I've spent a lot of time as an emergency physician practicing in the hospital emergency departments. And there is a standby cost when there's not a cardiac arrest or a bad asthmatic or someone really sick in the emergency department. But if you don't have it, you know, you, you, um, you wish you did when something bad happens. And I think the challenge we have in um, both climate change and, 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 you know, these kinds of health emergencies is that when we do our best work and nothing happens, no one wants to invest in it. So you have the, you know, the, ball, the, 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 the frog in the water phenomenon with climate change, where every year gets a little hotter and every year gets a little hotter. Uh, and then all of a sudden we wake up one morning and the water is, is tepid and then it's boiling. And people kind of ignored it, even though someone said, you know, it's a little hotter today. It's a little hotter today. And nobody paid attention to that. Now, you know, we're running around um, debating about who caused and how climate change is caused, whether humans have caused it or not. Um, I believe that humans have caused climate change, that fossil fuels is the major culprit. I don't have any doubt about that. Um, but I don't think anyone disagrees that the, the planet is hotter the storms are more severe, that we're worried about the, um, 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 what's happening with the, um, the ice melting at our, our polar, um, our ice poles, and you know, the North Pole and the South Pole. And we know what happens when we don't invest in addressing that more effectively. So I, 
you know, I'm, I am perplexed that we have a problem that is right here in front of us, that we can see it happening. And yet the amount of extraordinary denial um, is there. And by the way, it, there is a, it will cost us money to do this, no doubt about it. But a lot of the stuff is really pretty simple. And some of it is, is really pretty cheap. You know, just political leadership to encourage us to turn our thermostats down, to make sure that we um, cut off the lights when we leave a room. Over time, as we're renovating facilities, convert to, you know, um, um, what, you know systems that um, turn on and off when we walk in a room or we, or we you know, want to flush a toilet. I mean, the systems that we know and the science that we have to reduce our carbon footprint are there. They're right here in front of us. We just have to have the leadership to put them in place. Um, and what we know is that if we do that, it will take time. But if we do that, we can change the trajectory of our planet. But if we don't, you know, it's going to be trillions of dollars or pick a disaster movie that's going to be real. You know, we've had several amazing disaster movies about pandemics and we kind of watch them with some with fear, some with, you know, entertained. Um, well, I can tell you COVID-19 um, was a horror story. And I think most of us now know that to be true. Um Pick, pick one of those horror stories on climate change and then bring those two together. <laughs> that's our future if we don't do something. Yeah, and that seems like a, a powerful message. Um, you know, as, as you said, it was, it was predictable, it was predicted. You learned that this pandemic was coming, that the big one was coming, you know, in medical school. Do you think, you know, is, is this a, a useful connection to make? Is this something that policymakers can maybe uh, work off of or, or communicators to say, look, you know, we told you this was coming and it happened exactly as predicted. And we're telling you that you need to prepare for hurricanes, you need to prepare for climate change. Um, and, you know, do, do you feel like COVID might make people who were resistant or just thought, oh, you know, it's a, it's a problem for, for later, it's not my problem. Do you think it'll make people recognize more that it is a problem that everybody has to deal with? You know, we in the sciences are always too timid to say, I told you so. <laughs> but I think we ought to break that pattern. And I'm going to say for COVID, we told you so. We've been telling you that for years. You didn't listen. Um, it's a tragedy. And we need you to listen now. Now that we got your attention um, and, and business community, economics, folks, um, you know, all the various sectors. We got your attention now. We told you so. And we're, we're giving you some advice on how not to be as unprepared. Because if we think that this is the last pandemic, that this is going to be a hundred year pandemic, you know, we don't have to worry about this for another hundred years. I just want to remind folks, West Nile virus, Zika, monkey pox, um, H1N1, SARS-1, Ebola, those, those, were, those were red flags and warnings that the bad one was coming. And I think most of us, when we saw the SARS-2, we were worried. But it, once, we, once we saw the, the number of cases in China exponentially growing, mm -hmm. uh, I can tell you that in January, um, you know, and once we realized the way it was spread, my, I, you know, my staff and I said, oh, no, this is a bad one. Now, we, none of us thought it would be this bad. All right? None of us thought that. But it can fool you. And let me tell you, climate change. Again, <laughs> we had uh, two and a half times the normal number of storms last year. And that we've had that we've had accelerating storms, more severe storms the last few years. I, I don't know what it takes for us to, you know, to be slapped around to recognize that the environment is changing. Climate change is here. It's impacting our health today. It's impacting our water quality today. If we don't act today, we're, we're going to regret this, not 20 years from now, not 50 years from now, but every year to come at an increasing cost. 
And I just got to continue to iterate. It's preventable. We can mitigate a lot of this. No, thank you. Yeah, that's a powerful message. And um, I think at this stage, maybe we can pivot towards what, what, should, what should the next steps be? What does, uh, what does solutions look like? What, what, if, if, you're, if you think about climate and public health and pandemic preparedness um, and the lessons of COVID, you know, what do you think are some of the opportunities to, to make the world a better place as we try to recover from the pandemic? Within adaptation, we have a whole set of tools that are being used in health, they're being used in other sectors. They're called vulnerability, capacity, and adaptation assessments. And they help communities, states, regions to, to look at where are we now with respect to being able to manage our current climate. And what do we think is likely to happen with additional climate change? What changes do we need to make? We are relatively fortunate in health in that all of the health risks of a changing climate are current problems. So thinking about dengue fever, for example, changing its range, there's a lot of information about how one can control dengue. It's very difficult, but there's lots of information about how it can be done. Nobody needs to die in a heat wave. We've got lots of information about how to keep people safe during heat waves. And there is a program at CDC, the BRACE program, Building Resilience Against Climate Effects, that is working with a very small number of communities and states to go through and do these kinds of vulnerability assessments, to take a look at their policies, to see what needs to be implemented. And it's excellent that CDC is doing it, not only for these communities, because CDC can also capture the lessons learned and the best practices. We need to implement this across the US. We need for everybody to be able to engage. And as I said before, from the report, we need to engage in ways that we engage with the people who are the most vulnerable. When you look at our federal agencies, for example, NOAA has got RESA's Re Regional Integrated Science for Assessment. They're basically centers of excellence where there's partnerships between universities and the local community to move forward on a range of fronts at the same time. So we've got lots of tools around. We need to really move forward and upscale what we're already doing and making sure that we can reach out and work with the communities. And as George has talked about so passionately at the beginning of making sure we protect the most vulnerable, that has to be the focus of where we put our efforts and these partnerships that we need to strengthen and further develop. George's? Yeah, yeah, you know, we're gonna certainly begin to looking at um, how to make a just transition um, to a much more green economy. And we have to recognize that um, particularly for low-income individuals, they, they spend a lot larger percent of their dollar on energy than those of us who are more affluent. And so as they transition, and they have to, to a more green economy, we have to find ways to, um, to rebalance that equation um, so that um, they spend less of their dollar on energy. We're going to have to figure out as we begin to build differently in this country, um, you know, homes in the South are going to have to be winterized. Um, no, they didn't have to be winterized before. We're going to have to figure out how to do that. Uh, guess what? That means winterizing the, the wind fans um, in your community. It means um, protecting your generators from ultra cold weather. Um, it means following the advice when you get, you know, a review of your, um, your risk capacity. Um, there were some times when you could, you know, decide, well, I'm not sure I want to take that risk or put that investment in now. I'm going to tell folks they need to make that investment um, as a matter of policy uh, much more effectively. Um, I think that's going to be important that we, um, as we move more and more uh, to um, getting all of our sectors involved, you know, the healthcare sector is a uh, energy hog. Right, we spend about what ten percent of uh, at least the industrial part of our um, um, our of green 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 gases are put out by the health system. Um, we are we are a, a hog for energy, and we need that we need that energy. But we need to find more ways to green our facilities. Um, that means hospitals. That means replacing old power plants. 
that means thinking about also how we deal with our trash. You know, we we <laughs> we have a lot. We use a lot of plastics, a lot of rubbers, a lot of rubber goods. We we need to figure out how we deal with that as well, um, because that's also a, a another environmental problem we have to deal with. So I think um, from a policy perspective, all sectors have to be involved. We have to think of long-term investments. And I think we have to add in, in our calculations around um, what we're going to do something. We have to make sure that we count the, the health investments, the downside of health as part of that. So far too often we segregate and make this false choice between jobs and our health. And I would argue that you can't do a job unless you're healthy. You certainly can't do a job if you're dead. And far too often, we make this stark argument between jobs and our health. And we need to find a way, because it's important, to do both. So as we do this transition, we need to do it equitably. We need to do it in a just manner. Equitably and justice aren't, aren't equal. They aren't the same thing. And we need to make sure that we do it in a way that is healthy. Because at the end of the day, we want to move um, people from one point to another, not just cars from one point to another, not just burning something to burn it. We need to, we need to come up with energy solutions that, that, um, that advance our, the well-being of our economy. And, and by the way, um, we also need to make sure that, that we don't do climate change nationalism, that we're only worried about ourselves because um, tr you know, we live on this thing called the planet and again, the climate does not represent, does not recognize geographical or political boundaries. Yeah, and pandemics don't either. Uh, I mean, you know, of course, their closing borders can slow things down, but microbes are going to win. They'll go where they go and don't don't stay put. Um, and if I could add one yeah. perspective to what George has had to say, incredibly well spoken and incredibly important is one of our resources that we really should start counting on our youth. Students are so impassioned about climate change. The size of my classes has grown enormously over the last few years. They want to really engage in this issue. They're energetic, they're enthusiastic, they're creative. And one of the questions that I always ask my students is what is the one most important thing that you can do? which is always unfair to ask students because they have to read my mind of what's the answer. And the answer is of course, vote. That ensure that each of our communities has people that represent your values and vote for your values, vote for what you think is important so that we have the leadership in place that can take on the challenges that George has so clearly outlined. And, and let me add to that, you know, uh, my good buddy and, and, and Chris's good buddy, Ed Marbach, at George Mason University, uh, who does a lot of survey work um, on community values and what people think, points out that two thirds of all Americans say we should take action on climate change. So while our political leaders may not be there, um, as many of them as need to be, the public is there. They understand that we need to move this agenda. So we need to, to, to use that to, to build that movement and grab that movement and let people, you know, Call their elected officials, send letters, um, you know, let them know how you feel that we want action on climate change. We want it now. And one of the really interesting results from Ed's last survey was, again, three quarters of the U.S. public agrees that the climate is changing. They think it's affecting our health. They want something to be done. And then there was a question of, do you talk to your family and friends about climate change? There's only about a third of the survey responses talked about climate change. They're worried about it and they don't talk to other people about it. And so finding ways for people to start those conversations because that is a way that we can build more of the political will that we need to make the changes that the American public agrees we should be making. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it seems like this is a good time now that everybody's talking about COVID. Um, part of that conversation could also be um, you know, why was it so bad here? What went wrong? What, what can we do better next time? What, what systems do we need? 
um, and that you know that's a communication issue also um, to build build support. And to follow up on Chris, you mentioned more and more uh, young people interested in climate. And uh, Stat News just had a nice nice piece the other day about more and more young people going into public health programs or applying to public health programs. So uh, the youth are coming. And also, uh, apparently, science and health reporting uh, journalism programs too are also seeing a lot of interest. So that's one thing this this horrible pandemic has kind of shown the importance. Of um, of public health and and also of, of how it intersects with climate, um, yes. Yeah, so so everybody listening, you know, vote, talk <laughs> about it. Yeah. yeah. Let's see. So are there, you know, one of the, the the issue we're dealing with immediately right now is is vaccine the vaccine rollout, how to get them to people, how to do that equitably and justly and how to um, kind of build trust. And it, you know, climate is also a trust issue, it seems like, because it, you know, it's not something that any individual can fix. We have to kind of do it together. Um, do you have, you know, we're, we're getting near the end of the hour. Do you have some kind of final thoughts about how to, to build trust and cooperation to, to deal with some of these you know, in, incredible global issues? Well, let me start by just acknowledging um, that it's okay for people to have concerns. Um, and to ask for, for, for information. So that's the first thing. We have to acknowledge that. We also have to acknowledge historical warn, uh, wrongs that have occurred for various populations that we have. Um, we have to recognize that this has um, been politicized, which it, I wish it had not been, but it has. Uh, we should acknowledge that. But we also should acknowledge that this has been one of the most amazing scientific developments of my lifetime. And we've used over 10, 15 years of amazing work, understanding, going back to understanding the genetic code originally um, to make this vaccine, um, which is highly, highly effective and has been demonstrated to significantly reduce the morbidity and mortality from this disease. So we, we encourage people to, to, um, to ask questions you know, talk to trusted messengers. So it's not only the message, but the messenger. And if we can do that on climate, the lesson I think for climate change is that we need to figure out better who the trusted messengers are and send them out to talk to their family members and loved ones uh, about climate and give them things that they can do so they don't think this is just too overwhelming a problem to be solved. And one area where I have some encouragement is I've, I, I still watch mainstream media. I know I'm pretty old fashioned to do that. They have switched and you turn on your media these days. And what I see more accurately reflects the US than it did a year ago. That you're seeing a range of people, you're seeing a range of voices. And it's really encouraging for people to be able to see that there are people from all different perspectives that are engaged in COVID, that are engaged in climate change and being able to reach out and talk with people that, that you individually trust, whatever your criteria are. And we're really starting to see that shift. I'm, I'm very encouraged by that because it is the way we're going to start shift the discussions. We're going to start seeing greater uptake of, of vaccinations in places where there's hesitancy for very good reasons. And continuing those trends is incredibly important. Are there lessons um, either from other countries or you know, different parts of, of the United States of you know, in the COVID response or in the climate response where you know, there are things that worked that should be uh, implemented more broadly that policymakers should know about um, that you, you know, that you want to endorse um, in, in the little bit of time we have left or just encourage people to know about and, and, and pay attention to. I'll endorse what's going on in the state of Washington. We had the first outbreak and Governor Inslee has taken a science-based approach. He's talked with the scientist. He's very much informed by the science. And now we've got pretty much the lowest, one of the lowest rates of COVID overall and some of the highest rates of vaccination. One of our representatives is a pediatrician and she volunteered the other day. So you can go get vaccinated by your representative. We've got sports people who are coming out and helping with vaccinations. And we're having very high uptake 
uh, pretty low rates of disease compared with other places in the US and it's all informed by the science and it's a community effort. Nice. And let me just say that, you know, for me, leadership matters, yeah. science matters and good policy um, follows uh, good science and good leadership and it all matters. Great, thank you so much. Um, I'm going to turn it back over to Alex Reich uh, of, of the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine. Um, I wanna thank both of you so much, um, Chris Ebay and, and George's Benjamin for a, a really stimulating, important conversation. Thanks to NASM for hosting this and for convening, um, convening us today. And thanks to everybody in the audience for caring about these issues and for doing what you can to help us recover from COVID and, you know, and, and adapt and mitigate uh, climate change. And I'll turn it back over to Alex. Alex, thank you so much for bringing us together today. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Laura. Really, really appreciate your moderation. And thank you, Georges and Chris, for sharing your perspectives. Um, and thanks to everyone for joining the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine for our second climate conversation. The conversation was recorded and it should be available for viewing on this same webpage starting tomorrow. Um, for our April 15th climate conversation, which you can register, register for by clicking the link above or going to costofcarbon.eventbrite.com, we'll talk about the social cost of carbon and environmental justice in the United States. Um, Richard Newell, the president and CEO of Resources for the Future, will help us understand the social cost of carbon, its importance for addressing climate change, and how it can help advance just and environmentally sound policies. We'll announce the moderator and second conversationalist soon. Um, again, that's costofcarbon.eventbrite.com or the link just above. And we'll also share that information through our Climate at the National Academies newsletter, which you can also sign up for above. Um, as a final reminder, to share your feedback on today's event or your ideas for future events, please see the survey link also above. Um, and thank you all for joining us today. And uh, again, to George's, Chris, and Laura for sharing their expertise and time with us. Lastly, thank you to the Climate Communications team at the National Academies and to everyone behind the scenes who supported today's event. We're excited to continue the conversation through future events like this. And I want to ask you to say, stay safe and have a great day. Thanks for joining us.